Good morning, Crossview. What a blessing it is to sing praises to the Lord together. I invite you now to stand with us in worship. One, two, three, four.
battle is the Lord's and the battle is won. And we can rejoice as God's sons and daughters because we are reconciled to him. Today's scripture comes from 1 Colossians 1, 21 through 23. And in it, Paul says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. We put our hope in Jesus and the good news that the penalty of sin no longer means death for those who are reconciled.
devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain Beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been Faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me And it's why I sing Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips There is no one or thing higher or greater than you who sits on the throne. Would we adore you now and for all eternity? Would our praise always be for you alone? For you have given us hope and salvation and a home with you forever. And we thank you, Jesus. This is in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Maybe. Good morning, CrossFit Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning, whether in person or online. My name is Trevor, and I'm the children's ministry pastor here on staff. And like I said, we're just glad you're here. Um, and if you call CrossFit Church your home and want to give as an act of worship, you can do that on the with the black boxes on the back wall of the worship center or through the online opportunities, which are the app or 
the website. But if this is your first time here, we're just glad you're here. And so actually we love to get to know you. And so if you want to stop by the worship center and get a gift that we have actually for you, um, and then uh, we just love to get to talk to you. So we're just glad you're here. I do have a few announcements this morning, so hang with me. Uh, the first one I have is that today we are partaking in communion. Um, and if you are here and didn't grab your elements on your way in, please go now and you can get those at the back um, as we will take that together later on in the service. The next announcement I have is that men's ministry, Man Camp, is coming to Forest Springs Camp and Conference Center uh, the weekend of September 23rd through the 25th. And we are actually recommending that if you're interested in going, um, maybe look at the all day Saturday option, um, as this is a great way for all of our men to gather together and um, be fellowshipping together. Um, but if you want to know more information on that, you can see Mark Hafferman at the table in the lobby, and he'd be willing to help you, give you that information, and also um, get you help in signing up. The next announcement I have is the women's ministry. There is a women's ministry event that is taking place on Saturday, October 1st. Um, and you can come out and hear author and speaker Becky Kobitsky. I hope I didn't get that wrong this time. Um, and you can learn on how love like you mean it. So if you want to register for this free event, you can do so in the Church Center app or on the website. Uh, the next announcement I have is that Apex, our student ministries, is going to be starting back up again this Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.30, and they'll meet in the Apex room. And so if you know of any high school or middle school students that could come, please invite them, as Kale would love to have them here. And last but not least, today we are starting Sunday school. So if actually, to change things up a little bit, instead of just releasing, if any of the kids would like to come forward and join me, I know it's kind of scary up here. Come on, somebody would be the first. There we go. All right. Come on, you know you're not scared. Come on. It's fun up here. See, you get to see everybody. Now do you see what I'm seeing? Isn't this great? It's fun, right? All right. Well, we are so glad that we are able to have students and children's ministry here at Crossview Church. And as this begins today, we'd actually, um, I want to lift them up in prayer. So if you'll bow your heads with me, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Dear my Father, Lord, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the ability to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you, to hear from your word, and to just be able to fellowship together. Lord, I thank you for the opportunities that we have. And so, Lord, I thank you for the... Um, children here up on stage and that are also out already in the nursery in the preschool room. Lord, I ask that as we begin school, as we begin Sunday school, Lord, would they um, have open hearts to you? Lord, would your gospel come tr through clearly to them? And so I thank you for that. And I also lift up Apex as they start. And Lord, the same prayer, would your truth of the gospel, truth of your word come truly to their heart and they would be open and receptive to that. And so, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing here in our children's and youth ministry. And just help us the rest of this morning to be open to what you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, kids, guess what? It's Sunday school time. So you are now allowed to go to Sunday school. All right. And if you'll stand, we'll continue in worship.
exalt you in this place, Jesus, our King, our Savior, our matchless Lord. And we ask that you'd open our hearts, that we would be a people who would see you in clearer ways. We pray that you would show us your glory this morning. It's a big, bold prayer, but we ask that we would see your glory in a way that would make all the other affections of our heart bow to you, the one and only King of Kings. And so we need your spirit to have that happen. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you come, be among us, be working in us. And we rely upon you and we say we need you. 
And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, in terms of recent development in my wife Pam and I's life, uh, just a couple weeks ago, we became empty nesters officially. So we took our youngest off to college, so now we have two uh, at UW-Madison, uh, but my daughter Abby and my son Jared are both there. And uh, so yesterday, like all good UW parents, uh, we went and experienced a UW-Badger football game. Right, so we were there, uh, unbelievable experience, 74,000 people, uh, the marching band was there, it made me wish I would have stuck with saxophone when I was younger. They had uh, all the energy, the excitement, the things happening, obviously the result didn't turn out like we all wanted, but it was an incredible environment and very, very energetic environment. And one source said that a Wisconsin UW Badger football game is the greatest sports environment in North America. And they qualified it by saying, and yes, we've been to Lambeau Field. So there you go. At least a source said that. Jump around, the cheers, the excitement, an F-16 flyover, which made me choke up a little bit. Maybe it's the Air Force in me coming out a little bit there. But it was a powerful time. However, as I was there, I began to think about what we've been looking at in the book of Revelation. And I began to think about what it's actually going to be like in the new heavens, in the new earth, when there's going to be a crowd that the Bible says bigger than could be ever counted. Bigger than could be ever counted. Made up of every tribe, language, ton, ethnicity, all praising and beholding the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ our Lord. It's going to be absolutely amazing, and we are going to be there in glorified bodies. No more sin, no more struggle, no more sickness, no more pain. We've never experienced anything close to that, and we're going to get to that place, and we're going to see our matchless King and Savior on the throne, and we're going to hear the applause of heaven pouring out praise and honor and glory to our King. And it's going to be so amazing that any, and it's hard for us to believe this, but any earthly experience we can experience will pale in comparison to that moment. And as God's people, we get to live there forever and ever and ever. Yesterday, I also thought of what makes heaven roar with praise today. As I was midst in this deafening crowd of cheering fans, I thought, what makes heaven roar with praise these days? What creates a roar of applause or gladness? God has called Crossview Church to be participating in something bigger than ourselves. Something that generates amazing applause and praise and glory in heaven. What an amazing thought. And so this morning I wanted, as we're kind of kicking off the school year, I wanted to pause our series on Revelation just for one week. And I wanted to share with you something that's very much on the heart of God for you and I in Crossview Church as a life of our community. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to open it up to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is kind of towards the back of the Bible. If you get to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, keep going to the right. You'll see Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians is a short little book of four chapters. If you hit 1 Thessalonians or Titus, you've gone too far, go back. But in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, we're going to see how God transforms a human soul. How God moves us from brokenness to wholeness in his power. And so we're going to first look at the gospel work in our hearts. Look at Colossians chapter 1, 21 and 22. It says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds 
expressed in your evil actions. But now, he, Jesus, has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Paul paints this amazing before and after picture. And the thing that brings us from before over to after is the life and the death and the work of Jesus Christ. It's the power of the gospel that takes us from before to after. Before, it says you were alienated. That means a persistent, permanent state apart from God. The result was that you were, we were hostile in our minds before God. As we said last week, all sin is cosmic treason to a holy God. And in the before state, we had no choice but to commit that treason. Because we are slaves to sin. Before Christ, we are slaves to sin. We are living hopeless and helpless lives spiritually. Because we have nothing in ourselves to make ourselves clean enough to be presented to a holy God. It created this huge need in our hearts where we were spiritually dead, destined for eternal conscious punishment in the face of a holy God. Some people have painted a picture of salvation like we're out in the water drowning and we're kind of on the surface flailing our arms around and someone throws a life preserver to us and it's Jesus written on the life preserver and we stagger and we swim and we get and we grab the life preserver and we're saved. It's a faulty way of looking at salvation. The Bible says we are dead. We are 20 feet under the surface, drowning, dead. And God in his mercy, in his grace, in his loving kindness, reaches through the water, grabbed a hold of us, and pulled us out revived. New life. No longer alienated, no longer separated from God, but brought into his presence, and not just brought into his presence, but brought into his, his presence faultless, blameless, holy, because of Jesus Christ. Verse 22 says, You are brought in there holy, faultless, and blameless before him, before God. We were drowning. We couldn't save ourselves. This day we marked the 21st anniversary of 9-11 where we remember levels of evil and deception that changed our world forever. And we remember those who've lost loved ones. And we remember those who have callings to protect us. But even in that event we see that in fact the whole world cries for something better. The whole world cries for something kinder. The whole world cries for something greater. And then in comes Jesus. When Jesus enters, he changes everything. Jesus changes every hopeless and helpless situation. I encourage you to invite Jesus into every area of your life because he will make you whole and present you blameless, faultless, holy before this God. See, the Bible says for us to stay in heaven one millisecond, we need to be absolutely perfect. Spiritually, we need to be absolutely perfect to stand before a holy God. In comes the problem that you can see, right? None of us are perfect. None of us. So what are we to do? In enters Jesus, who goes to the cross, becomes our sin, pays the penalty of our sin, and then gives us this offer of new life that if we repent and ask forgiveness, he covers us in his perfection. And then we get presented, reconciled, it says, brought back into relationship with God the Father in his holiness, in his blamelessness, in his faultlessness. Whose record do you want to stand in before a holy God? Yours or sinless Jesus? 
Jesus offers us to stand in his sinless, perfect, spotless record. See, we need a perfection outside of us in order to do that. And Jesus provided that. It's this amazing gospel message. Some of my favorite Crossview Church moments are when that sinks in for the first time and all of a sudden the spiritual lights explode. You know what I'm talking about? Many of you have experienced that here. I've seen people come into these services and then afterwards they come and they talk to me and they're stumbling through their words trying to find the actual words of what they're feeling but they can't really do it justice. And so tears flow and, and before you know it, we're talking and they say, I want to get right with God. And they pray and they give their lives to Jesus Christ and they ask him to come in. And then they're this new person. And I'll say, start in the book of Mark. And before you know it, they call and say, I'm done with that. What do I do now? And they're just hungry on fire to know God. When that happens, there's a deafening applause in heaven. A glory to God rings out because of the work that Jesus Christ did at the cross, transforms broken human lives, moves us to that place where we will stand with him in the new heavens and the new earth, worshiping him forever. It's the way God intended. And this gospel is intended to be lived out. Look at verse 23. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Now the way this is written in the original language, Paul has no doubt that those he's addressing will live for Jesus to the end. It's worded like this. At any rate, if you stand firm in the faith, which I know you will, then you will stand forever. Paul is saying when you encounter Jesus Christ, how can you not live the rest of your days with him? When you encounter his love and his mercy, when you were pulled out of that water, when you were once alienated, alone and hopeless, unable to approach the throne of God in your own imperfections, and then he came and pulled you out and presented you before God in his perfection and blamelessness. How can you not live for him the rest of your days? A love so amazing, so divine, demands our life, our attention, our all. Out of this love, gratitude, unbelievable apprehension of trying to comprehend what God did, we now live in this day and age. And don't miss this, Paul does express here that faithfulness to Jesus to the end is essential for the Christian life. We are to become what we are in Jesus Christ. He makes us new. He clothes us in his perfection. Then we spend the rest of our days on this earth moving and growing closer into that perfection in that holiness because his love has transformed our hearts we can't live any other ways we are not led by any of the other attractions of this world but we want to build the rest of our lives on Jesus because of what he's done I remember a young lady who attended our church a while Shortly after we became Crossview Church, when we went from a multi-site of Woodlands Church to Crossview Church, I met this young lady through a, a chaplain call in her city as I was serving as a chaplain with the police department. And she was without a doubt in the worst spot of her life at that moment. She just watched her fiance die in her arms. She went through some horrible, painful things, was in an ER getting attended to physically experienced tons of trauma and I met her and I met her family and we talked and we prayed and we cried and three weeks later she was sitting right over here on a Sunday morning and she came back the next Sunday morning and then the next Sunday morning she came back and her mom and dad were with her and the next Sunday morning she came back and her mom and dad and her two sisters were with her 
And they came and they came and they came. And that Christmas Eve, they came up to me in tears crying. And that young lady and her mom and dad gave her life to Jesus Christ that Christmas. And they kept coming. And they kept growing. And a year ago, last September, I did her wedding down in Illinois. Had the privilege of doing that. And now she is living for Christ in a way you can't imagine. It just oozes out of her. And she's a dental hygienist going to dental school. And you look at it and you say, praise God. Applause in heaven. For I once was lost, but now I am found. And when we hear stories like that, it should create a longing in our hearts to say, God, show us more of your glory. Show us more of your glory. Moses in the Old Testament asked God that statement. He prayed that prayer, God, show me your glory. And he said, if I do, you will die. So he hid him in a cave. He walked past him. God walked past Moses. Moses could get a little taste of his glory. And after Moses got a little taste of his glory, you know what happened to Moses? He asked for more of his glory. He was never satisfied All through Moses' days, he kept praying, show me your glory, show me your glory. Once you taste the glory of God and you see the power and the majesty, nothing else in this world will satisfy. And we're created like these vacuums of wanting the glory of some heaven right now in our midst. And we say, God, show us your glory. Let us see that more. Let us see some gospel praise in heaven. Look at the rest of verse 23. It says, this gospel, this good news that changes before and after has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven. And I, Paul, become a servant to it. This gospel is the only thing that transforms. And it's been proclaimed at this moment when this was written to the entire Greco-Roman world. And when he says throughout the world, he's not just talking really about geographics, he's talking about ethnicities. It wasn't just a Jewish gospel, but it's a Jewish Gentile gospel. All people, all ethnicities, every tribe, every language, every people can now have soul-changing hope in this amazing thing called the gospel because it's the only thing that will transform a human soul. Self-discipline will not do it. Self-help will not do it. Self-focus will not do it. The only thing that can change your soul is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so our call now, once you ask Christ in your life, is to press into that. Receive it and live it out. Live out this gospel that brings applause in heaven. When Paul sees this and knows this, he says, I have become a servant to this gospel. He actually says, I have become a slave to this gospel. From now on, my whole life is going to be nothing but living in the awe of God and living out as a servant of this gospel to tell people about what Jesus is has done and who he is and how he can transform and change any human heart. It changed him. And the way you become a servant of the gospel is you constantly remember what it was like being under the water. And you constantly remember that gracious, merciful hand that pulled you out and the revival in your soul that took place You never, ever leave that as a Christian. You stay in that place and go deeper in it. And then the second way you become a servant of the gospel is you do what it says in verse 23, where it says that you remain steadfast and grounded, not easily lured away from the God by the ways of this world. Living as a servant and carrier of God's mission in a way that brings applause in heaven. Applause that goes directly to Jesus because we owe him everything. It pleases God. And those currently worshiping in heaven now, to see us live out the calling 
as servants of the gospel in the world that we live in today. It brings applause in heaven. So how do we bring more applause in heaven? What is the gospel vision for Crossview Church? I want to share with you something that years of prayer has gone into. Late night conversations have happened. Back in 2019, the elder board and staff of our church started wrestling through this idea of asking God what his vision across your church would be. 2019. Now, doesn't 2019 seem like 10 years ago? It wasn't that long ago, but it seems like that long. We've been at this for a while, asking God, God, what could Crossview Church do to create some applause in heaven? What could Crossview Church do that would bring you glory? And this is the statement we wrote and came up with that we wanted to share with you. We want to glorify God by seeing 5,000 people impacted by the ripple effect of Crossview Church living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in our city and beyond. Now let that sink a little bit and read it again. To glorify God by seeing 5,000 people impacted by the ripple effect of Crossview Church living out the gospel of Christ in our city and beyond. I want to unpack this a little bit, kind of step by step as we go through it. First of all, the first thing you see, to glorify God. Glory to God. Glory means weight or heaviness. In ancient days, a person's greatness was determined by the weight of their assets. A king's greatness, a king's glory, was determined by the weight, the physical weight of how much they amassed and owned. Glory is the infinite weightiness of God. It's a display of his infinite greatness. It's incomparable. God did not need us. God didn't create the world and the universe and humankind because he was lonely. That's bad theology. He didn't need that. God created the world and the universe and the human race because he wanted to showcase his glory. He wanted to show us how amazingly great he is. And from start to end, from creation to the fall to where we are now awaiting that time where Christ came and he rescued us, but now we're waiting for the fullness of his kingdom when Jesus comes again in the new heaven and the earth. From start to finish, it's all about his glory. It's all about the glory of God. We want to glorify God in all that we do, in our lives personally and corporately at Crossview Church. Second, seeing 5,000 people impacted. Now notice it doesn't say we're going to become a church of 5,000 people. It says something greater than that. It says something better than that. It says that we will impact at least 5,000 people. You and I as Crossview Church living out the gospel in our world will impact at least 5,000 people. People in our neighborhoods, people in our cities, people in our workplaces, people in our schools, and people, yes, in other nations. We want to impact locally and globally. And how are we going to do that? Through a ripple effect of living out this gospel. Because he pulled us out of the water. Because he revived us. And as we soak that in, the amazing grace of God, the amazing transforming power of God. Now when we uh, soak that in and never leave that place and then be launched back into our worlds that we live in today, we will have gospel impact just by our presence and living out the way he wants us to live you don't have to change jobs. You don't have to go to a different country. Jesus saw you 
alienated. He saved you. And now he wants you to stand firm in that gospel-saving power to love him and be overwhelmingly grateful to him for all that he did and then live that out as you're loving and praising God wherever you go. That's the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. As you stay connected to Jesus, this fruit comes of your life, this goodness, this kindness, this holiness, and it radiates off you and it creates ripple effect. It creates impact. Now, God has used this church to create gospel ripples in the past, and he's going to do it again in the future. There's a reason God has called us here as Crossview Church. And some of the ripples that we do and some of the ripples we have done have been because of a collective effort that we do as a corporate church. We recently allowed the building of a church in Matamoros, Mexico. We funded 40000 for them to build this building. And now this church planter who has four other churches is seeing out of this church a beacon of ministry of the gospel in dark, dark places in Matamoros where people's lives are being changed around. That's a ripple. Each one of those people living out their lives is a ripple. How Elementary School. We send volunteers there. We did it in the past. We're doing it in the present to send these little ripples. In fact, we as a corporate body just last week made a huge gospel ripple in the country of Burkina Faso, West Africa. Do you know that? Burkina Faso, West Africa, Crossview Church made a huge ripple. There's a friend of mine named Chris Laddish who spent over 25 years of his life and his family's life growing up in Burkina Faso, West Africa. They went there with an organization called Wycliffe Bible Translators. And they went and lived in a village called Jibo, north of the capital city of Ouagadougou. And they lived in this Muslim village where there was no running water, where there was no electricity for over 25 years because they wanted to learn the language that these people spoke because it was never written down, give them an alphabet in a grammar structure so they have a language and then give them the New Testament in their heart language so they can understand what Jesus Christ did. And after 25 years, they did it. They had their language put into an alphabet form. They translated the New Testament. A few years ago, they passed out the New Testament and tears were flowing down these people's faces when they found out that God loved them enough that he pulled them out of the water. And last week, Chris called me and says, we have this huge opportunity right now. He says, we can take that translation of the New Testament Karunfe language and get it recorded and put it on a phone because the Karunfe people are growing all over Burkina Faso, Africa. And now they could listen to that gospel message in their heart language. And he said, so I'm writing a bunch of people. I'm telling all my friends about this because we need to raise 1,500 bucks to start this project. And Crossview Church said, out of our missions budget, we'll send 1,500 bucks right now. Get it going. Make a ripple. Let it ripple across. We continue to ripple with things like our Sunday services with Apex every Wednesday night. Kale and his team are making ripples with our middle school and high school students. We do it in VBS, in children's ministry, making ripples in those little hearts that they remember Christ. We will do things collectively, but do you want to know the biggest way we're going to make gospel ripples as Crossview Church? The greatest way we will make gospel ripples is by you living out the gospel every day in the world that God has called you to. 
That is how this church is going to make an amazing impact when you as a follower of Jesus Christ are transformed by the gospel of Jesus and you live it out where you are. You, like Paul, are now a gospel servant wherever you go. You, like Paul, are like a minister wherever you go. You see, a very unbiblical practice crept into the places of the church many years ago where you live out your world and you have like your church life and then your work life and your family life. And when you ran into somebody in your family life or your work life, you call the church and you say, hey, can a pastor come and call this person or talk to them because they really need to know about Jesus Christ. The church should reach out to them. And I said, absolutely right. Guess what? You're the church. You reach out to them. You don't call us to do the job that God called you to do. Now, you call us, but here's what that conversation sounds like. Dan, there's this person in my life I met. I know that God wants me to talk to them about the gospel. I'm scared to death. I don't know if I can do it. Will you help me? How do I do this? How do I say it? How do... Now we're getting somewhere. Picture all of us doing that versus two or three pastors making 400 phone calls to people who really don't know us and want to talk to us. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. God called you on a mission. The Bible says you are a minister. Everyone says we're ministers as pastors. No, 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 no. Ephesians 4.12 says the role of the pastor is to equip the saints for works of ministry. We're to equip you. You're the ministers. Now picture you go into your world now, not just going and saying, I got to go through the motions, I just got to get to Friday, but you go and know I'm on a mission from God yes. to carry the gospel, that these people in front of me who are, don't know Christ are going to eternity and with a Christless eternity where they're going to be an eternal conscious punishment if they don't turn their lives around and know God. And God called me. He put me in those people's paths. I'm held accountable. And when you live and begin to speak the gospel, you make a ripple. And then before long, that person makes a ripple. And before long, that person makes... And 5,000, for goodness sakes, we should be at 20,000. 5,000 is nothing. Now, you understanding that you are ministers of the gospel and wherever you are, God has called you to be a minister of the gospel is so critically important because you need to see that when you go back to your world, not with just this ho-hum, I just exist, but when you go back to your world with the love and the mission of Jesus Christ oozing out of you and you're intentionally thinking that I'm here as a gospel servant to Jesus, then we will make huge ripples as Crossview Church. Picture if every one of us lived out this vision. Picture if anyone, every one of us left this place abandoned to Jesus and abandoned to his mission for his glory. Like I said, 5,000 is nothing. to glorify God by seeing 5,000 people impacted by the ripple effect of us as Crossview Church living out that gospel in our city and beyond. We want to do local and we want to do global. We're not going to put one of those against each other. We're going to do both because God does both. Now, that's our vision, but don't forget our mission don't confuse it. Our mission is leading people in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do this. This is the what we do as a church. We lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. The vision is where we're going. The vision is what the result is. This is what we do. As we live out this mission day in, day out, the vision will take place. And when we live out our mission day in, day out, all of a sudden we view our homes differently. All of a sudden, we view our families differently. All of a sudden, we view our jobs and our schools differently. We live out this mission to create this vision, to glorify God by seeing 5,000 people impacted by the ripple effect of Crossview Church living out the gospel of Jesus Christ in our city and beyond. I don't know about you, but the rest of my days, 
I want to be part of a church that's going to do that. I don't want to be part of a church that's going to add to you segmenting your life into all your different pie-shaped pieces and you come in on Sunday and check the box you had done and you go back into your world totally apart from the fact that God called you to be a gospel-proclaiming beacon. I want to be a part of a church that does that, where all of us are on mission, where we absorb the amazing work that Christ did in our hearts, and then we say, I'm on mission to bring as many people with me to heaven as I possibly can. In light of that, all of us, you and I, have to examine our lives and be done with lesser things. Think about the things that take our time, our energy, our money, and our attention. Are they for gospel purposes? If not, this is the time and place, as we've been studying Revelation, this is the time and place to be done with lesser things and let our hearts be captured by a greater gospel vision of what God is about and what he wants us to do. We will be fully satisfied when we taste the glory of God on mission for him. Nothing in this world will satisfy us like that. I guarantee you. So how do we live this way? First of all, we embrace our mission to accomplish our vision. We embrace that mission of leading people in a growing relationship with Jesus to accomplish the vision of creating these ripples. See yourself as a gospel servant. See yourself as a carrier of Jesus' presence and love and mission. See yourself as a minister right where you are today now. He might call you to do something else. He might call you to move. But for sure, he's calling you to live in a gospel way now. In the Old Testament, anytime God declared something extremely important, he gave his people a symbol to remember it. He always attached what he said to a symbol because he knows how distracted our hearts can be. And he gave us the symbol to remember it. When you leave the sanctuary this morning, there's going to be on a table a group of pebbles. And I encourage every single one of you to grab one of those pebbles and put it somewhere where you can look at it tomorrow morning. And when you get ready to launch into your world, you launch into your world differently than you did last week. You launch into your world thinking, I am on a mission with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going out to make a gospel ripple because I'm going to live this out. You embrace our mission to accomplish your vision. Second, you connect with others to stay on mission. Christian, Christian life was never meant to be lived in isolation. You were meant to live in a small group of people, to share life, to study God's word, to support one another, to serve each other, to serve as a group. Those are the markers of our life group ministry. Today's the final Sunday to sign up for life group. If you haven't, I encourage you to do so. Or find a group of people that you can connect with and do life together. Finally, meet with God daily to stay on mission. Meet with God daily to stay on mission. We have a Crossview Bible reading program. You can pick up the Bible reading program that we're doing as a whole church. We are in Matthew and the Psalms this week. You can pick it up at the Welcome Center or go on our website. If you go to our website, it's right there under the resource tab. I talked to three people today who said, I did it this week, and it was amazing. God's showing me things in his word. We're going to experience that together as a corporate church body. Participate in that. D.L. Moody said this, so if you turn one to Christ, that one may turn a hundred, and they may turn a thousand. And so the stream, small at first, goes on, broadening and deepening as it rolls to eternity. Let's make a ripple. Ordinary people living out their lives right where God has called them, changing the world for eternity to glorify God by seeing 5,000 people impacted by the ripple effect of Crossview Church, living out our gospel, his gospel, in our city and beyond. If Jesus decides to wait longer before he returns, let's do something for Jesus that outlasts ourselves. 
Let's do something that creates applause in heaven. Let's do something that makes gospel ripples. Let's pray for that end. Jesus, we thank you for the way you transform our lives. And we ask that you would create in our hearts people who receive your gospel and people who live that out as ministers. Let us not wait for some church program. Give us all we need by the power of your Holy Spirit to live where we are now and to see ourselves as the church living them out this gospel in the world. And Lord, where we're afraid, I ask you to meet us in that place. And where we're hurt and broken, I ask you to meet us in that place and bring healing. And where we're confused, I ask you to meet us there and bring clarity. Help us as a church community to live out this amazing work and message your way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our service by communion today. And I thought, what better way to close out such a message than to take communion as a corporate body? Jesus himself gave the church a tangible reminder of the gospel called communion. And we want to celebrate that. Here at Crossview Church, you don't need to be a member to take communion. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you're a member of God's global church, you can take communion with us. Parents, we entrust you to be the spiritual leaders of your home. And so if your children understand the gospel and they become Christians and they understand what communion is, they can take communion with us. We leave that decision in your hands. And finally, we ask that you would hold the elements until we take together as one corporate body. The gospel that we're going to remember is that Jesus Christ forgave us. He cleansed us. He set us free. As we just saw, the Colossians 1.21 says, Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds, expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy and faultless and blameless before God our Father. Jesus did that. Do you ever feel like you need to know if you're forgiven or not? I mean, as Christians, we know that when we sin, we repent and ask forgiveness, and God forgives us. The Bible tells us that. But do you ever, like, wonder, am I really forgiven? I mean, I know I ask for forgiveness. I know the Bible says I'm forgiven, but sometimes I just don't feel forgiven. Have you ever been there? Well, the church throughout the ages has struggled with that. All of our brothers and sisters that have come before us from the time Jesus was on earth to now struggled with that. And one of the reasons God put communion in the church was to remind us that, yes, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we are truly forgiven. And the church throughout the ages had this practice called communion where they walked out of the church knowing their soul was cleansed before God, not because of anything that happens in communion, but because of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done. What if communion became a moment for us at Crossview Church where we, as a corporate group of people, could sense the forgiveness of God on our souls together? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Now that's a whole different deal where we could sense God's forgiveness corporately together. And that's the purpose of communion, to give you the space and the place to sense God's forgiveness. So what I want you to do now is I'm going to give you a moment of silence. And in that silence, I want you to think of all the things that you regret. I want you to think of all the things you did this week that you said, gosh, why did I do that? I want you to think of all the sinful actions that you seem to be enslaved to. I want you to think of all the things you did this week that you, or the things that you know you should have done this week that you didn't. 
Or maybe, like as I just got done talking about, maybe think about all those lesser things that your heart's attached to that are lesser than the person of Jesus and the gospel that frees people. I want you just to think about all that stuff. Think about all that sin and let it come to mind in that moment of silence. And then we're going to affirm together God's forgiveness of those things. Let's take a moment now. I remember my things. Do you remember yours? Now I want us to join the church throughout the ages in doing something they called public confession, where they spoke the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ among themselves to remind them that they are forgiven in Christ. And so we're going to do this as one biblical community gathered together. We're going to read this out loud together and join the church of the ages in public confession. So join me in reading this. Lord, I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. I have sinned in my thoughts, words, and actions. I bring those to the cross and I ask that you forgive me today. I need your grace. God, we need your grace. And we thank you that you gave us that grace in your son, Jesus. And Lord, we ask as a corporate family that longs to seek and follow you, that you'd forgive us for our sins. We repent of the things that we did that were not pleasing to you and the things we blew off that are. And God, we ask that you would meet us in that place and forgive us and bring your grace and help us to live holy lives. We thank you that we can come to you with these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Receive these words of comfort from God as well. Let's say this slide together. Lord, we receive your forgiveness. We thank you that in Jesus Christ we are completely forgiven and set free from our sins. Remind us, Jesus, that nothing can separate us from your love because of the cross. Church gathered here at Crossview, receive the forgiveness of your Savior, Jesus Christ. You are forgiven by God. With that, let us take communion together. You could take your elements now. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body that has been given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said among his disciples, that this cup is the covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We thank you that you pulled us out of water when we were drowning and lifeless and you revived us, giving us new life. We thank you for your forgiveness and we thank you for your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we walk out the gospel life in the world that I'm about to send you off to, I thought, what better way to close this off than giving God praise, than giving God all that glory that he so richly deserves. And the way I want to do this is we've done this a few times at Crossview, but I want to sing the doxology together. 
Some of you uh, know what the doxology is. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay. If you know what it is, join in and let's sing and worship God together a cappella. I'm going to invite you to stand as we close this out. If you don't know what it is, just hang back and uh, take it in. But the goal of this is to give God all the glory, honor, and praise. And if you know the doxology, as I've said before, don't leave me hanging when I sing. Right? <laughs> Let's praise God and give him all the amazing glory for what he's done. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a glorious day.